Okay, welcome everybody. Um, it's on the hour, so we'll we'll uh, make a start. So um, I'm Louise uh, Reardon. Um, I convene these webinars with Greg Marsden. Uh, we chair the um, Governance and Decision Making Special Interest Group of the WCTRS. Um, and these uh, series of seminars we've been leading for the last um, year are really about um, generating the conversation around various uh, theoretical, methodological, empirical debates relating to transport and governance. So we're delighted to end the year um, with a webinar from uh, Milos uh, from Alto University, who will be discussing with us um, emerging urban mobility technologies, responsible innovation and anticipatory governance processes. Um, Milos will talk for approximately uh, 30 minutes um, and then we'll have plenty of time uh, for question and answer. Um, this session is being recorded, um, just to make you aware, and all of our webinars are available on our YouTube channel. Um, so if you've got any questions uh, for me, Loss, as we go along, if I could ask that you put them in the Q&A function, please, rather than in the public chat, it just makes it e easier for us to gather those together. Um, and then uh, we've got plenty of time for debate at the end. So thank you. And I'll hand over to uh, Milos. Thank you, Louise, for that introduction. I think you should be able to see my screen now. Yeah. If not, yeah, I will probably hear from you. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. I think I've seen some familiar names. So uh, glad to um, at least um, um, kickstart this conversation opportunity. Uh, so um, those of you who know me, I do tend to um, uh, cover a lot of ground. So just heads up, uh, basically. Um, I'm coming to you from Alto and um, engineering, uh, but let's see how much of engineering we actually end up, uh, end up talking about. Um, and another warning besides the heads up is this, um, like you, if you probably go online and check my profile, you're gonna think I'm a, some kind of weird uh, person in between these different uh, tribes. Uh, so let's see if uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm certain that that will show up in the uh, in the new course of the talk, but um, uh, maybe we can come also back to this fundamental challenge. Why have we been, we been sort of siloing knowledge uh, knowledgees um, uh, in the in the previous century, and we're continuing to do that in this century? That might be a bit of an answer to our present day, um, present day challenges, but okay. Um, no more uh, of that kind of uh, disclaimer. For, so, so basically what I'm trying to um, kickstart the conversation with is a couple of points. Briefly, why do we need to govern um, urban mobility technologies uh, and, and a bit um, in connection to that, uh, understanding technology and, and then understanding this word uh, emergence. Um, in front of the, the word technology that at least I like to put uh, oftentimes there and then end up with a couple of um, points of what, what uh, should we should do. Um, so uh, this will be mostly talk about uh, technology, but um, of course within a kind of a larger scope of, of governance. Um, but to put this on a, on a kind of a, a big Big picture, why are we doing this? Well, uh, if you kind of combine the path dependence, um, the classical graph of path dependence, and then the futures cone, you get something like this. So we're basically trying to break yeah, our uh, current automobility, break out of current automobility regime. Um, and this, will, this requires a bit of um, imagination of different kinds of, uh, possible futures. Um, I don't want to go into the whole question, what, what is future space? People usually, usually present it as represented as this kind of a two dimensional space. For me, it's probably n dimensional, it's been moving and so on. But um, let's say this is about path breaking. Yeah. And that's why we kind of, at the end of the day need steering. So I, I hope uh, we're on the same 
same page uh, uh, regarding that. So I, I think Jack was also there in the audience. So um, uh, like I, I ended up reading various other kinds of things and then I ran into, into uh, um, responsible innovation and then I was like, okay, well, this is a very nice list. In fact, it's something that you can also find in planning theory uh, papers, maybe just expressed in, in a bit of different words. Yeah? Uh, but if you talk about uh, Governance. You, if you talk about responsible innovation overall, it kind of makes sense to have these four four principles. Yeah. So kind of anticipate, as opposed to uh, forecast that we have been doing in transport uh, for some time. Reflect and deliberate, and then eventually sort of assign responsibilities. Yeah, or or reassign uh, roles and responsibilities is maybe even um, something we can return to uh, one way one way or another. And then another thing um, that will from now on be an important topic is uh, complexity and not on some kind of a surface buzzword complexity. Um, it's something we're trying to teach, of course, to our uh, next generation of uh, uh, engineers here in spatial planning and transportation engineering. This, this, you know, we talk about cities being organized complexity and of course processes of planning cities also being some kind of organized complexity. Uh, basically trying to move beyond this uh, old paradigm, um, 19th century, or maybe just post-enlightenment paradigm of instrumental rationality, and then this kind of um, ceteris paribus cause-effect uh, understanding uh, that has dominated uh, disciplines in, in urban mobility. Um, not to name, it's of course not just engineering, economics, and various other kinds of disciplines. So um, basically we, we are kind of trying to do that and that's that's one of those important um, aspects that we need to understand. A lot of people just don't understand causal loop, the, you know, diagrams, second order effects and so on, which is sort of strange, uh, at least for me in 21st century, but okay, yeah, that's, that's that. Um, so uh, let's talk about technology, I mean, um, I'm, I'm, I'm from School of Engineering, so I'm kind of supposed to talk about technology. Um, I will use irony a lot, be aware of that, uh, yeah? Um, so that was one of those uh, moments. Um, so when I say technology, people think hammers, yeah? Or uh, automated um, vehicles, well, it's, it's a very broad, uh, definition, at least for me, what is technology? Basically, anything that is mediating our worlds and, and we use to reassign meanings, to reorganize everyday life since the Stone Age. Um, as human is a technological being, yeah? That's the kind of the, the state of being being human. And on, on the left side, you have this kind of uh, urban robots, uh, self-driving vehicles, or in a th at least an imaginary of a self-driving vehicle, and on, on the right side you have this um, is uh, one version of uh, uh, mobility service packaging uh, uh, advertised as uh, mobility as a service, um, and we can talk about it uh, as well. So, um, mass is one word. STVs, um, self-driving vehicles, is another word that might pop up. But for me, they are just examples yeah, of technologies. Um, they don't have to have um, a three three dimensional form. They can also be a website, yeah? a digital thing, uh, as much as some other uh, physical things. Um, but then, if we talk about sort of when I discuss with our students um, in in our um, educational programs here, so people who have done their bachelor's in engineering, they come to, to this is fourth year, or some other people, and then I ask them what is technology. Yeah, I like this uh, existence of questions. So we have this question, what is technology? And, and a, a lot of times over many years, I have been getting these um, surface uh, understanding answers. Yeah, usually people say tools to achieve goals. Yeah, oftentimes again, they limit them to material things. They're there to solve problems. Technology's progress uh, leads to better life. Um, oftentimes we don't think about risks or harms. That's uncertain. Uh, although of course benefits are also equally uncertain. And then especially if, if we go back to systems thinking, second, third order 
consequences that doesn't exist yeah that's just in the domain of we didn't intend to do that um and then of course it's uh, technology is the result of engineering or applied science um oftentimes and this is something we will come back to inventors are single superhuman individuals um and then uh, government is of course not supposed to choose winning technologies these are some of the surface uh, surface points so then kind of, kind of going back to um the first thing that of course we throw at their, their table and that's something that has been there also in the in the responsible innovation field is this kind of future dilemma yeah and going back to the the path dependence and futures cone um from the beginning is the question at which point sh should you do what for technology yeah? and before you kind of reach a lock-in point down the road you're, and you you're not really uh, capable of um uh or at least not with with low cost in a sense of cost in generic uh, terms changing the technological trajectory um, as opposed to in the very beginning when you might be actually very uncertain about um, what we used to call impacts yeah i prefer much more the word implications but uh, because it kind of moves away from this uh, a causes b uh, in brackets uh, thinking um, but anyway, let's say that this is one of those di di dilemmas that we have um, inherited from the 20th century. It has its use yeah? to help us to help, help us think about uh, what is the underlying problem, decision making under uncertainty, which is kind of like what urban planning has always been, or should have always been. Um, except now, we, we this uncertainty has hit us with a shovel in the face uh, this year, so we're kind of waking up to it. But Beyond the uncertainty, uh, I would like to talk about emergence. Yeah? So um, it's it's an important word for me. Um, why? Well, um, to kind of go back to the the question uh, of of governance, uh, there is a relation, yeah, between governance and emergence. So if you are supposed to develop how we uh, innovate, if you're supposed to steer, especially steer away from the current uh, path dependence. If you're supposed to kind of deal with this um, uncertainty, anticipate, and so on, well, you kind of should understand not just technologies, but sort of how do they emerge? Yeah, and I'm not. I'm trying to avoid this word "develop," uh, and I, and I'm trying to use this word "emerge" or "emergence" um, exactly because it has a bit of deeper meaning coming from complexity sciences, at least for me uh, personally. And, and we can try to reassign it other meanings if you, if you are uh, willing to do so. It's open, open for, um, further conversation, as we said in the very beginning. Um, so let's talk about a bit that, um, this is one of my, uh, favorite, uh, quotes. Uh, the book is called existential pleasures of engineering. And it has a very, very nice two sentences. The main trouble with engineers has not been their lack of morality. So we have had ethics, codes of ethics and, and so on. Um, it has been their failure to recognize that life is complex. Yeah? Um, so let's let's talk a bit about that um, complexity. So again, we're not we're not talking about simplicity and we're not talking about chaos. In, in, in complexity theory, there is a bit of a range there. This is some kind of organized complexity. It's not disorganized. Um, Complexity, it also requires you to understand that being is uh, relational. Yeah? That I am because you are, or I am because we are. It's, a, it's, a, it's one of those um, uh, fundamental uh, challenges. But let's say if, you, we, if we're going to talk about technology, this usually leads us to do two other fundamental questions that I also like to ask our engineers or our future engineers, what is to be a human and what is justice? at least in, in transport uh, uh, studies and, and practice, uh, we are still struggling to move away from homo economicus, human, and we are still struggling to move away from utilitarian uh, justice. So whatever is not those two, that's sort of what I'm thinking about uh, answers uh, to those two related, related questions. So human is a very much multi-dimensional, um, much more, uh, deeper being than uh, the homo economicus model would would tell us and justice is of course much more multi-dimensional uh, complex uh, concept in itself that deserves 
to ask for us to for, of us to ask you know process ethics questions but of course distributive justice questions as opposed to just um, the usual concern with the aggregate some sum of effects and then if we talk about in general yeah this is the kind of um that the, the, the same part just to kind of again clarifying clarifying um, that point so defining technology means uh, defining what is to be a human and of course what is moral and oftentimes people kind of thinking about technologies pretend that they are not defining these two other things yeah and that eventually this leads to kind of redistribution of benefits and burdens in, in simple terms or, or reshaping of what is to be a human uh, at the end of the day. As this very nice uh, quote from um, that I took from the Design Museum in Helsinki. So some of these pictures that are just pictures, they're, they're um, uh, mine. So um, as, it's, as it usually goes, our obsession with um, one concept is actually the answer is plurality well we should uh, embrace the fact that we are talking about technologies as plural and in this case emerging technologies we'll talk a bit further about emergence um, and then further i would add this kind of everyday technologies again some useful distinctions that we should have between let's say you know factory technologies um, to put it bluntly in my simple engineering terms or even urban yeah technologies as sort of urban spaces have their own um, organized complexity as we talked about uh, at the very beginning so there are a lot of associated um, terms or ideas to, into which i can't get into right now but let's say there is a lot a lot there and the idea is plurality again moving from this kind of a it's the same turn, turn that has happened in philosophy of technology where we're trying to move away from just sort of you know, Heidegger sitting there and looking at the ceiling and just thinking about what is technology and providing one um, one answer to kind of uh, dealing with the, with the messy realities of, of, of plural, plural, plural technologies. And then if I go back to kind of um, this emergence, well, or permanent flux uh, of, uh, of things, there is basically, it's, it's actually quite straightforward. I mean, uh, um, uh, the beauty of complexity is its um, straightforwardness, um, not simplicity. So you, ha you usually have uh, some kind of you know, hierarchy, you have structure, sort of top-down forces, you have self-organization, you have sort of bottom-up forces, and then you have um, the heat. Yeah, so if these are the salt and pepper, you of course have the heat. I'm just making a metaphor of ingredients needed to cook a meal. Um, and you, you have processes over time, yeah? So you have top down, bottom up, you add time, sort of dynamics over time. And if, as these dynamics happen over time, well, that's bottom line uh, what it is, yeah? Um, except there is another kind of a, uh, important, it, and it's, this is a rather difficult cognitive sort of concept for many people um, that you have basically layers in the system. Um, and this, of course, we can talk about this kind of coevolution uh, and, and, and uh, persistent persistent state of this this equilibrium uh, around which you're kind of um, bouncing. But basically, if you think about uh, any complex human, as 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 a, you as an individual, you're a complex being, and the kind of the individual uh, atoms and, and and genes don't add up to your being, yeah, to your personality, and so on, yeah. So whatever happens on on, on the lower level layers doesn't really add up to the upper level layers yeah? and you can you can find uh, these properties throughout the whole um, world yeah and just in case of uh, technologies we can of course talk about how people think feel talk identify themselves what they do in relationship to technology we can and then we can talk about mes meso stuff uh, such as uh, governance rationalities even uh, affects, yeah, organizational affects are actually quite powerful in, in um, determining the, the direction we take. And of course, we can talk all, all, also on some upper level levels of uh, bottom line, larger structuring um, things to which we can come back to the end, this kind of, you know, militarism, masculinity, Californication uh, as another term, which we can open up uh, as well. But basically, you have to just brace with me that this is a bit um, like that. Uh, so we end up with the fact that um, 
this um, nonlinear technological change creates ecological, not additive change with there is the, the long the, and it's also of course a long uh, long time yeah that's another another one of those uh, those things especially in urban mobility takes uh, some time to kind of overhaul uh, the system then uh, usually there is um, values yeah, there are values that are built into technology so technology is not value neutral oftentimes these values are just by a limited few um, that's why a good um, uh, twist that I throw to our engineers, as opposed to technologies are tools, I tell them technology is ideology, yeah? as kind of pushing them to think just like this vision um, of some kind of seamless flow of whatever here is um, uh, from top, top down of the city. Um, and of course, this emergence, uh, if you talk about these values eventually leads to kind of solidifying and destroying values. So we, we actually, at the end of the day, don't just change sidewalks or concrete. We end up saying that we're not going to have this value anymore. Yeah, And the one uh, oftentimes, these are some values that we have been discussing, at least in, in the Finnish context. And uh, some of these values have been, for example, or one I can just bring, bring to the surface is um, let's say um, children's independent mobility. Now that's one of those, like, do you want to have future where uh, we still have in Finland at least very high uh, percentage of, of children walking, cycling, taking public transport by themselves or with their peers without the supervision of the elderly people um, or older people. Um, so, you know, this is not just important for their health, physical health, but uh, for their cognitive development and so on. So it's kind of like a value you would want to protect in the future. Yeah? Um, if I, when I ask this question to, uh, to some of the automated vehicle um, experts, they're kind of like, they can't even pr pr comprehend what, I'm talk what am I talking about? What kind of a life uh, d does this value pertain to? Uh, why wouldn't children be driven around? Um, as passive uh, subjects. Um, and of course, this is on the other side, questions of, of um, uh, challenging the institutional landscape. So this is another shopping list, if you want to look at it, of different kinds of um, organizations um, and the redistribution of power between them, or maybe eventually even disappearance, at least in the transport sector, or kind of connected to, for example, uh, mass or, or, or self-driving vehicles. Um, of course, this list can go on, yeah? As, as mobility, again, is such a uh, kind of uh, central um, aspect of, of life. Yeah? So then in this process of, of um, re-stabilization and social learning overall, we have to, of course, turn to rhetoric. And then interpretive flexibility is another important point there, uh, as they play an important role for attracting resources, aligning actors, sort of steering. Yeah? Rhetoric is part of this uh, uh, steering. But to me, it's super funny that this, um, like a lot of people in transport, at least nowadays, don't uh, have never heard of this interpretive flexibility. So I see a lot of, like also in mass, like people start writing, I see a review paper and then, okay, or a paper, and then I, there, uh, there is no definition of mass, but these people have provided a definition. But I really want to provide a definition, and here is a definition. That's the whole point. If technology was not a, an emerging one, it, that you would have you would have had the definition. You can define a pencil. I mean, we can all agree it's an object you hold in your hand and you write with it, and it's usually of this kind of a shape. And sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't work. But it's sort of like, and you can do other things with it, like roll. Um, let's not go into affordance, but let's say pencil is a sta stabilized object. This mass is not a stabilized object, so you're not supposed to have a definition. And then on top of that, it also is very nice because. Uh, we can all assign different meanings to it. Yeah, you, me, the cities, municipal—you know, kind of larger municipal organizations, governments, private sector. Everybody assigns whatever they want to see in it, but underneath is is conflict. We don't agree what this actually is um, because it has not been solidified uh, one way, one way or another. This is one of my uh, uh, one of our students and uh, my made this very nice meme. But then speaking of mass, this I found this video the other day and I just couldn't resist to just, you know, put the quotes there. Yeah. So this is from a YouTube video, Rhetoric 101. 
I, I, I love this fact that people uh, going back to this again, uh, kind of uh, uh, critical personas in innovation, people neglect the fact that technological um, emergence requires a lot of people and a lot of tinkering. That's what we know, yeah? But then people pretend to be fathers, yeah? Speaking of masculinity and kind of patriarchalism. So apparently people call this person father of mass. I don't know, just for the sake of fun, have you heard lately about the mother of mass? Um, I'm being ironic, of course, here. So this is Sonia Heikela, someone who has actually published this thesis about mass in 2014. And at some point was the face of mass until somehow for some reason disappeared uh, from the scene. Um, so uh, going back to the, uh, the same video, it's still this it's a beautiful three or four minute video that has all these catchphrases. Uh, apparently private sector is, is good in innovation only. That's again, something that is uh, one of these deep, deep uh, myths of, um, of in, at least from, you know, within the emergence. I think this, the spelling there um, is somehow subconsciously discovering our own challenges. Um, and then of course, if we turn back to kind of tr transport as a, as a, or mobility as commons, uh, as it should be, uh, apparently this is about freedom. Um, it's again, some kind of a surface rhetoric of freedom, uh, sort of very nicely uh, goes back to uh, Henry Ford um, one way or another. Um, I think we, we can all agree that mobility is about freedom, but that's not the only, only thing there. Um, it's, um, it's one of those uh, challenging uh, concepts if you just rely on, on freedom, yeah? And of course, on the other side, we just need a lot, a lot of supply. There is no, there, are, there is no need to do any kinds of trade-offs. Apparently, in in, in like we don't need planning, yeah, in cities because it's not about trade-offs. Uh, so you just ne add more supply of everything. Yeah, um, there is no, no need to prioritize yeah? anything um, one way, one way uh, or another. So um, that's a bit of zooming in. Uh, I have ma many other points, of course. Uh, this is just a, uh, still surface uh, surface uh, stuff, but let's talk further, yeah, emergence. I think we have to kind of embrace the fact that this is deeply uh, irrational process. Yeah? This is me tinkering with, with, with another device, um, traffic controllers at, in my past life. Um, you cannot see it there, but there is a smile on my face, yeah, making things work and behave or behave maybe even, yeah. Um, uh, on the on the um, on the kind of global level, we have had this irrational exuberance, yeah. That's the the, the dot com bubble was one of those um, um, periods when this term was associated to, to that, and of course we on the other side maybe are just. Um, avoiding or uh, aversive to instability or, or even kind of fear of this uncertainty. You can find uh, very, very nice papers about how Nokia fell uh, because of this fear, organizational fear at the end of the day. I think we discussed this also with, with Jack, fake it until you make it framing, which of course goes back to this, um, that work, working technology is the result and not the cause of it becoming a successful artifact. It's one of those, you know, uh, again, common uh, misconceptions. So you kind of, and we usually do it again, going back to rhetorics, you do, you, do, you do it with these kinds of things, with visions, with advertising, with sort of the visions come first and then you reshape the world around the technology to enable it to actually function. And of course, uh, we have had to do a lot of changes to make um, our system of automobility uh, revolve around the car. Uh, so on, on this, again, going back to, to the horizon of futures that I've been talking about, we don't tend to expand, but we actually tend to narrow down the horizon of these possible futures. Because why? Well, because this is how we have always done it and let's just copy the same principles. Um, so uh, one funny thing that I saw was, okay, we have been copying principles of traffic signals into how self-driving vehicles should operate, traffic signal being the device from uh, 19th century. Yeah, Which again, going back to this um, uh, surface versus uh, deeper conflict, it kind of hides away yeah? that uh, there is a value conflict and 
um, previous speakers in this in this series have been talking about that kind of um, agonism. So I think th they should innovators should read a bit of Chantal Mouf, I think, uh, at some point. Um, and of course, this is about national growth. Yeah, you have this kind of ceremonial justification that well, why should we do something well? Technically, because it's about economic growth. Or, or maybe just nationalism yeah at the end of the day because we are the ones who, who are the leaders yeah uh, so there is a lot of that kind of that kind of rhetoric um, over there so not because we really need this technology to sort of address our problems but because you know it wouldn't it wouldn't it be cool if if we would be the ones sort of we versus us again um, us versus them rhetoric yeah and then, of course, this um, is usually to us to uh, portray to us as some kind of a stable system. Again, on the left, uh, and even if if it's portrayed as a large uh, ecosystem kind of a thing, it has it's never portrayed as a sort of a process, yeah, of things, dynamics, people moving in and out, and and kind of a lot of people moving in and out and 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 muddling through this whole thing. Um, but the the rhetoric remains that it's again uh, Elon Musk or whoever is the is the great visionary uh, somehow there. This right figure is not from an actual innovation uh, process, it's, it's from uh, urban planning, but I think it's a, a good enough example. I would like to see these kinds of figures for innovation processes, but maybe that's part of the part of the game. Um, and I, I also love this uh, screenshot I took from one of the uh, uh, presentations from the EU. Uh, apparently people, uh, w were people here, yeah? Um, people just need to be um, asked simple surveys about acceptance or not, and maybe we just end up uh, assigning them as, as believers or or skeptics or, or deniers, yeah, or, and skeptics. So it's also assigning what kind of you know how do we see people in this whole in this whole story. Um, at the end of the day, I would also like to throw this one into the game that this is uh, eventually going to come to the table about, especially about self-driving vehicles in urban areas, that this is about kind of um, militarism overall. I don't know if you know about these laws, uh, super uh, funny acronym, uh, but it, in fact, it's lethal autonomous weapon systems. It's just a thought. Somehow I have a feeling that uh, this is, the history will repeat again because the reason why we have automobility is larger but also because of military. If you don't know your history, military was the one who pushed trucks uh, first and foremost um, onto our streets. And then um, that's how, because they were very useful in winning the First World War. So I think we're kind of being served a Faustian bargain here um, overall. Uh, we are bargaining under, under condition, conditions of unequal bargaining power. And of course we have uncertainty, but we're sort of like, do you want AVs like this or, or like that? Like that's our option apparently. Um, so you either get AVs or, or uh, uh, in this version or in another version, there is no choice in between. So uh, let me take a couple of minutes now at the end to just bring some hope yeah, to the table. Uh, what should we do to steer? Um, it kind of goes back to the very classical uh, solution in, in urban planning as well. Well, and enable people yeah, to come to the table and to highlight these, uh, you know, th this kind of deep agonism that we have. Um, you can do it in person, you can do it online. I think we have a lot of these things, uh, but it's kind of paradoxical that we accept that this should be a legal requirement in laws for planning our cities, and it's not a legal requirement for for deciding about urban technologies. Of course, we need to experiment yeah, with new, uh, especially inter-organizational roles. This is one example. I'm not saying it's the best example there, but it's one of those examples that someone has tried to at least uh, think about yeah, in, a in LA. Um, and then of course we have to think about what new kinds of, kinds of governance domains and processes we have to um, innovate in itself. Yeah, So innovating the the overall processes is probably the most important one here. And in the transport domain, we have a lot of classical policy levers that we should still do. Yeah? We should do them even without thinking about technologies like parking yeah? um, policy. But then we should think about data governance, algorithm, you know, algorithmic governance overall and other, other kinds of things like that in that, in that domain uh, because uh, 
this needs this needs steering yeah one way or another and and kind of just the plus part is here at the end of the day uh, I, I talked about this at some some other occasion we always have this option at least i have this option as a as a as a human being of descent and and speaking of of self-driving vehicles for example we have seen these kinds of you know um uh, at some point we have seen people even shooting them but you know you have these prints and and then um and then of course uh, you know painting over markings and so on so that's a separate topic but i would say it's definitely also morally justified even if it's not legally uh, justified so um to sum it up again with the asterisk uh, simple sums don't really work in complex systems but um uh, briefly, yeah, I tried to kind of uh, bring this uh, uh, point that this is this is emergence, um, socio-technical emergence, emergence as a process of uh, social unlearning overall, and that we need we need collective imagination and emancip emancipation if we're gonna move beyond this uh, technological determinism that we are being served. Um, so steering, I guess, also in, in involves some decisions about stopping. I, I don't think anyone is uh, putting that option on the table to just pause self-driving vehicles, um, at least on the kind of um, transport policy, which is something we should do right now for foreseeable future until we resolve our, our climate uh, challenges. And then we should, of course, ask these other kinds of things. Is this really kind of the, the only opportunity we have to break out of our, our pet dependencies? And, and of course, um, uh, should we act um, now about this, um, this underlying dilemma? So, yeah, that's, as I said, I, I, I talk a lot and uh, I will now stop talking uh, in, this, in this context. Thank you for your attention. Looking forward to the conversation. Thank you very much, Milos, for a really um, thought-provoking um, talk. Um, I've had a great question um, to kick us off. Um, so um, when you were speaking about the uh, emergence of innovation uh, within the transport sector, how do you see the significance of the layers you mentioned? So the micro, the meso, and the macro. Should innovation emerge top-down, bottom-up? Or should there be some sort of interplay between those layers? Mm -hmm. So this is this is the difference between should and is. I think uh, this uh, this is like this already. It's already is that you have top down and bottom up forces. Yeah, we're just kind of pretending that it's not like that. We keep on blaming, like you know, the, 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 some people uh, like the you know the rhetoric you saw from from um, from Hieten and it's sort of like. No, we don't need top-down forces. Like what? <laughs> like like we don't we don't need gravity. That's sort of kind of a claim that that someone. So to me, just shows that we don't really understand sort of technology and innovation overall. I mean, this is how it is. How smart will smartly are we going to or wisely maybe better word are we going to do this kind of you know combination of what we do top down and bottom up? That's up to us. Yeah, the devil is in the details. But it's it's just is top down and bottom up process. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Katrina's asking and um, saying thank you for a wonderful and inspiring presentation. How can the community make uh, put pressure on the government to regulate emerging urban mobility technologies? Good question. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, it depends on when on your. I guess uh, I don't know how far should I go into. Um, into my own uh, past uh, here. Uh, it depends on, on your particular communities, I guess. I mean, we have some uh, maybe uh, opportunities inside of uh, Europe to do this, uh, quite, you know, opportunities for this in, in the States might be very different in other places, even more different. Um, now the question is like, what's the role? I would say here, maybe what's the role of academia? Here? I mean, as you, as you can see, I'm not, the person who keeps my mouth shut, <laughs> even if I'm in surround, surrounded in this ecosystem. And I mean, kind of, I, I try to keep close uh, interaction with people in the in this in this sector because it also keeps me grounded in, in their own realities. Yeah, it requires for me to understand also their side of the story. Uh, so anyway, bottom line is, um, uh, I think we need academia to get involved so that these kinds of processes get more legitimacy. 
because otherwise they're not, they're just in the void right now. Yeah, they're in the institutional void. So even if we have um, sort of laws for, as I said, for, for public participation in, in urban planning, we don't have these kinds of things. In, in on the level of Europe or on the level of, uh, of, of individual nation states or even cities. Um, and I think we should have, I don't, I, don't, I don't see the reason why we shouldn't have uh, sort of a bit of different innovation context when we talk about urban uh, technologies or mobility technologies in particular. And uh, believe it or not, this is a very difficult topic even in this, so in this commission report um, on ethics of, of automated vehicles, even within that group, there was a bit of friction of sort of why should we have public deliberation? I mean, it was kind of super strange to me. <laughs> why not? But uh, when we started and it, to discuss this, but okay, eventually we had managed to put it into that report, but even that was sort of, um, like if, even if it took so much friction inside of that group to, to get it kind of put into a piece of paper that is supposed to be independent from the commission. I mean, what kind of uh, <laughs> obstacles are we talking overall? That's why I think at the end of the day, if this doesn't become uh, legitimized uh, from in kind of, you know, in, in, in the policy uh, itself, uh, uh, in the institution itself, you always have the right to moral dissent. And I will at least personally exercise this uh, <laughs> right. Thank you. So uh, Perifan, apologies if I'm mispronouncing that, um, is asking a follow-up question related to that. So public involvement en masse um, can have both pros and cons, in my opinion. So the challenges might be how to bring about the values. Um, I don't know if you have mm -hmm. any. Responses. Yeah, of course. So. Um, I mean, we, we need to start with this kind of, I mean, that's again, like it's super, super classical, uh, but just completely neglected. You just start with a bit of deliberation of what kind of a life you want to live in the future, what kind of life we want to have humans live in the future, give the voice to the unborn, yeah, give voice to nature. Um, and you know many other many other kind of actants uh, that that are for for whom we are responsible today bring about the underlying conflicts. Um, so agonism, yeah, that's why I mean I, we can go back to the other recordings in this in this whole um, uh, series. That's why I said I think people in innovation should read uh, some Chantal move <laughs> to begin to begin with. Um, so we should start with this. Yeah, we should start with, with, with not hiding the value conflict. I mean, mm -hmm. it's because eventually it's gonna bite bite us back. I mean, that's even on a kind of a simple, me being simple engineering technique, I want my nice technical requirements. Let's resolve them, yeah, mm -hmm. by having better functional requirements. So related to that, um, Nick's saying, um, great presentation. Uh, social media seems to play a powerful role in shaping public narratives around new tech. Um, what can be done to help make sure that that role is positive? Yeah, well, uh, so this is like, we have to govern technologies that shape our governance of technologies. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's, the, that's the 21st century we are. So I think we are in the domain of life where we are kind of not recognizing this as humanity we're in this kind of oversaturation state of 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 technologies and 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 this is a kind of a classical problem how much are we losing control over what's going on um what's going on here um so i think we definitely need to do something about that i don't have an answer uh, I, I don't want to be an oracle here you know <laughs> i don't think this is how it's supposed to be especially if we talk about um, going back to what I was just talking about. Yeah. So I think we need to open up this for this, for the discussion. And I think not just about technologies, I think this is also very un, un, under um, studied and under recognized. How much do we actually, um, sort of how much do, so, how much, how much of this technology is, that social media is actually shapes our reality. I mean, even on, and on the fact of mobility, how much it actually kind of keeps us in our, in our, you know, car addict or, you know, bicycle advocacy, advocacy bubbles, yeah? <laughs> and then you, these, these people don't, don't end up actually deliberating. Uh, it's uh, undermining our, our democracy, you know, as, so, as we know. 
Maria's asking, to what uh, extent should car industries be involved, uh, considering their role in high-level policy arenas, um, especially in Europe? I think, uh, so to, to go back to kind of those images of, of, um, of networks, that's why I think this needs to be a multi-actor um, process. Uh, but uh, uh, again, this requires a bit of learning of all the different actors. Yeah, we kind of come back to uh, fundamental challenges of um, integration of different knowledges and 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 uh, starting value points. We need spaces for friction, basically. I mean, that's the same kind of answer from that you have in in uh, otherwise. You, you, we we can't stay in this kind of like you will have an automate uh, you know automation conference or whatever via car manufacturer conference and then you have uh, us academics again speaking in our own bubble, but we need some other uh, um, kind of levels of, of 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 government, especially at least in the European context. We need the Commission to step in and say let's create forums for friction. I mean this is this is um, a must, especially in in these kinds of. Um, Kind of re revolutionary uh, uh, technologies. So I mean, we can't avoid this friction. So that's why we need to kind of at least create this agonistic debate uh, about these things. Even if, of course, there will be power brought to the table and so on. But I mean, um... girls asking um, that we may think that success of innovation is measured by its successful acceptance by the market, which takes us back to a, a dominant utilitarian approach. How uh, would you challenge this view? Some big questions being asked of you. Here, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, I've brought it to myself. <laughs> <laughs> And I know I'm fine. This is this is great. I wish we could actually have this in instead of uh, you know in person. Uh, well, in, we are doing it, but sort of more um, now. You're mediating. Yeah, you are now the technology. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I uh, uh, so it was um, it was about kind of acceptance. Yeah. So so um, um, yeah. Of course, time to market. That's the classical indicator. Like how quickly you can you can put something on the market. Uh, well, I didn't want to go there, but of course, we have, this connects to kind of, you know, how do we understand money and how do we understand uh, the current version of capitalism and everything else, which is, I think, other many other people have been talking about this um, uh, for for uh, for a while. So I'm not going to go and I'm not going to go in there. I'm going to talk about our own tribe. Yeah. So what I like to tell to our colleagues, please don't do surveys where you ask people, will you accept or not accept? automated vehicles yeah sort of like this you know acceptance uh technology acceptance model i think it's very obs obsolete yeah it kind of goes back to this again kind of neoclassical um ec homo economicus it sort of forgets that this is a social learning reshaping and so on so so please don't do those surveys and then please next time don't assume this is a fixed technology yeah accept that it's still being shaped and reshaped and that you yourself with your own writing you have a responsibility in in sort of framing it yeah so don't take it as given uh as as many people start saying you know the first sentence and i have done it in the past i mean i'm not saying i i, I haven't made my sins yeah <laughs> sort of like you know automated vehicles are happening well hmm, what when how <laughs> And so on. So, um, Jack had his hand up and has now popped up on our screen. Uh, Jack, yes, are you there? Human. <laughs> Hi. Hi, all. Hi, Milos. Fascinating Hi, stuff as ever. Um, and yeah, I think you're absolutely right about acceptance. I would just just add that I think acceptance. There's something else that's betrayed in the acceptance talk, which is a lack of confidence among the people developing the technology. So it's not quite technological determinism, which is here is a technology that you should agree is great. I think it actually betrays a, a sense that we don't know how to make this technology work, so we want you to make it work for us. Um, mm -hmm. But I just, I, and as you know, I agree with you, you know, on, the, on, on the, the spirit of what you're saying. I just wonder, I want to get you to reflect on mm -hmm. what's been happening, you know, with COVID, um, that I guess, you know, I see some of the most interesting experimentation happening within the technologically determinist frame rather than challenging the technologically determinist frame. If you see what's happened in London with the rapid 
experimental creation of low traffic neighborhoods, right, which have caused disruption and controversy and, and all the rest of it. But it seems to be quite an interesting model of the state playing innovators at their own game rather than trying to change the game. And I just wonder if tactically there's something that you can say about you know whether it whether at some point you have to accept that technological determinism is a really powerful story and maybe we should join that story rather than say no stop pause discuss conflict work out the values before we do the tech mm -hmm. how would you i mean i, I I'm, I'm now I would like to have this as more as a, as a conversation how would you do this I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm on board with you. We should, of course, experiment as well. Yeah, it's not just about sitting in a room, talking all day. We can, of course, go in the, in the streets and do some things and then come back and then, and then discuss. But, um, but is there something that I'm missing here? Well, maybe it or is you, about... Do you think that I'm missing? Well, so, I mean, I think one of the implications of a responsible innovation approach might be to say we need to, rather than challenging experiments and the ownership of those experiments, we need to find ways to, you know, join. We need to, we need to collaborate, right? Recognizing that maybe technological experimentation is the order of the day. I don't know. I mean, it, I think mm -hmm. it's a, it might be a matter of tactics rather than, rather than a strategy. Yeah. No, no, no. I, okay. I agree on that, on that point for sure. I mean, I, I, I would definitely be on for, for, uh, for that kind of, collaborative uh, experimentation with you know episodes of friction <laughs> as well with words and then some friction in technologies um, um, themselves as you know how, how it will go in reality some things will fail and I know kind of as a sort of simple engineer some things will just not work um, I think on this on this level um, this is why I, I mean it's a, it's a tough book to read but I love Aramis from from Latour uh, as, 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 as that kind of, if we, if we just had, he of course writes this book ex, ex post, but if, imagine if we had this kind of narrative analysis as you're actually experimenting with things and people are then being kind of testing and then, and then being reflective about, about this stuff. But it's, to me, it's also funny that people, uh, we still run into the same kind of problems with, okay, sharing of vehicles, for example, that Aramis had back in the eighties. Uh, but we sort of are not are not reflective here. So one one point here is what what are we doing on a kind of a long term learning level, and then what are we doing with kind of short term, yeah, experimental um, learning. So I would I would like to have also some mechanisms for long term learning because we seem to be repeating uh, some mistakes from the twentieth century. Uh, at least that's nice. Least yeah. My, yeah. Okay, I've got some lots of comments and things coming in on the chat. Um, Greg, you had a question. Yeah, thanks, Minos. Really interesting. Um, I mean, I think we're going through this cycle at the moment with even things like electric vehicles, where the you know the the, the announcements are all about just replacing the current technology with a with a new one, rather than anyone being given a a kind of template to rethink how they want their local areas to work. Do they want all these connections and stuff everywhere? But the thing that um, interests me and challenges me about uh, what you're saying, which I, I find fascinating, but um, politics is about um, making things simple. And it's about um, dealing with problems that are here and now in, in, in the short run. And I, I feel like it's it's almost like the, the conflict between uh, thinking about the longer term goals and the, the immediacy of requirement to do things today with which kind of brings forward the kind of solutionism and the kind of narrow thinking about and communication about technology. I'm wondering if you've given any thought to that side of things. Yeah, so on, on, on both points, um, and this is also a bit, a bit of uh, uh, reflection back on what, what Jack was, was saying. Um, there are probably, uh, you know, various kinds of technological determinism there that we need to study uh, further. And to understand further our kind of um, the subconscious here, I think is. I mean, I don't want to go. I don't, I'm talking about like Freud, yeah, <laughs> or whatever, but just these myths that we keep on sort of uh, repeating to ourselves. And then speaking of those myths, I think it's also um, 
it's it's the same kind of uh, one one of the other books that I do recommend to our engineers is Models of Democracy. Yeah? Again, to kind of accept the fact that there there is there are choices that we also have there. Yeah, that there is no one one model of democracy we we uh, um, we even have, and then we should or could have. Yeah. So the the funny part with these technologies usually is that they kind of are a very nice mirror that that ends up being put in front of our face. And it tells us much more about ourselves, in this case, our own polit political uh, structures, than it's about the actual uh, technology itself. Yeah. So I think we, 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 need to, we need to think about different ways we do politics as well, as much as we uh, will have to think about different, um, different technologies. And that's kind of, I, as I said, I'm not, I'm, the worst thing I, I would do would be to suggest or to, to 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 say this is the solution <laughs> to the to this model of of new model of politics. Um, I don't know. I just I just I, I think we're also maybe stuck a bit in in our imagination. Um, and we've had a, a reflection in the chat that um, agonistic debate um, is maybe doomed to be won by stakeholders that have always uh, run the show. You know that have the power to influence debate. Um, so they think we should be paying more attention to governance ru uh, rules, um, et cetera. Um, another reflecting point, yeah. um, on the frustrations of um, thinking that we should have infrastructure that, that improves, but to the point staying almost as it is now. Um, so even bike lanes um, on our minor um, cars dominate most of the, the picture still. Um had a question about um, this, picking up on your point earlier about innovation being seen as a strong suit of private companies um, and that in, with mobility, you know, it tends to be more public ownership um, or publicly funded. Um, so might the, there need to be more of a, a conception of mobility as a need, a basic need, rather than thinking about uh, returns on investment, for example. Is there a kind of fundamental issue there with how our, our transport systems are, are set up? Um, and Carol's asking, um, how, do we, how do you think we can make engineers more sensitive to the, their, the, the moral perspective of their work? Um, a simple course won't do. Do you have any reflections on that? <laughs> um... Oh no! Great, great points. I think this is this was <laughs> supposed to be a bit of existential. I, I told you at the beginning. <laughs> um, uh, the, the 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 my hope is that eventually you will be the one asking yourself these questions, <laughs> and then and then maybe gaining some momentum um, through that. But um, just to kind of clarify this previous point, um, I, uh, I I have also been thinking about this whole kind of commons stuff and so on um, uh, that we, we, we need to, well, if, you, if you think about the classical kind of the, the economic stable of, of goods, yeah? And you know, the excludability competition and so on. Um, I don't think you can really put mobility in there. Yeah? I think that table needs to be revised. If someone in the audience could do that, I would be super uh, grateful, grateful, <laughs> grateful for that because I think Mobility, exactly because it's sort of a central aspect of everyday life, it needs to be reimagined as some kind of um, dynamic commons. Yeah, uh, even beyond Ostrom, and, and and there has been a lot of people in this kind of post-Ostrom commons, um, commons people, and so on. So um, uh, at least that's my kind of take take on it. And then uh, regarding Kyle's uh, uh, point, um, I think this needs to. This is kind of how do you how do you change thinking? Um, yeah, you have to change talking and you have to change identity on the level of individual. Yeah, and I I start with with that uh, in our own engineering programs. And this, of course, uh, the way I'm, I'm I'm explaining this is I'm saying them to them we have to start using new words. So we have new we have to have new t talking, in order again to reshape our thinking. But we also have to accept that. Whatever you think uh, or whatever the society is imposing on you to, as what engineering is, it's wrong. Yeah? So I'm trying to give them other examples 
how engineering is a lot about imagination, creativity, sort of being understanding people, sort of learning a lot of social science uh, and so on. It's not just about tinkering, but it's of course about tinkering, but you know, um, you have to know your, your, your humanities. Um, and, 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 and I'm kind of, uh, so, so, so identity of course needs to come also from engineers from, from within. I mean, they need to kind of um, uh, question, question this. And of course, this is not enough in a, in a course, this needs to be an ongoing uh, discussion um, in publications, in, in, in many other things, but, but thinking will not change if we don't change how we talk about things and how we perceive ourselves at the end of the day, um, at the end of the day there. And the final point that we'll have to end on is a couple of people reflecting on how it's hard to regulate emerging technology. So maybe we need to think about actually the problems we want to solve um, and have that sh uh, steer innovation. And also a point about given the, the climate emergency, do we have time for these uh, reflexive and deliberative debates? Uh, you know, uh, what needs to come first, some decisive action, or <laughs> I guess that top down, bottom up dynamic then comes into play um, a little bit more. So you've, you've generated a really uh, a great debate, lots of questions and comments in the chat. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Milos, for, for ending our seminar series for this calendar year on such a high. Um, we had a couple of people asking about the references you made um, to, uh, to uh, MOVE uh, and others. And so I suggest that if you if you want those references, I'm sure if you drop my, Milos an email, he'll be happy to, to mm -hmm. signpost you if that's OK, just uh, Milos. Um, yeah. So thank you everyone. Just say, hope you have a wonderful um, break um, over the, the festive period and look out for uh, more um, adverts for our forthcoming uh, seminars um, into the new year. So thank you everybody. And um, Greg, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, just say we've got, um, we think we've got February and March uh, lined up. Uh, we are interested in uh, people who want to put themselves forward for, for talks in April, May, May and June. Uh, it's been a great program so far. So uh, please do let us know if you, you'd like to give a talk at some point. Yeah, please do get in touch with us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.